This is the last coffee house, and today we are talking about one of my favorite books so far from the Sam Harris reading list. It is Eichmann in Jerusalem: A Report on the Banality of Evil. I loved it. Oh, holy mother! This was uh, this was something not only for the content of the book, but the the way it was written, the controversy that surrounded it, the ideas in it, the very very important ideas in it, and so much else about it. You know, getting a real real background on what happened. <laughs> What the hell happened when it comes to, you know, one of the worst, most horrible things in the history of the human species, if not the worst, and obviously the most visible monster when it comes to humanity, when it comes to this particular primate. So this book, it was, of course, authored by Hannah Arendt. It was published in 1963, and it's about the trial of Adolf Eichmann. So the stuff that's in it, and I can't, like, I'm not going to be able to go chronologically <laughs> through what is discussed in the book. I really, I'll get into the, you know, full analysis or whatever, but it's it's structured really well and that it goes in and out of different concepts and, and times and ideas around the trial, and it's just, it's fascinating. Number one, just talk about the, the subtitle in itself. It's a report on the banality of evil, and of course this is, as far as chess pieces are concerned, this is a pretty significant piece of the whole Nazi machine when it came to instituting the final solution. Eichmann, as we find out throughout the, the annals of this work, was specifically engaged in organizing the transition of, like the geographical transition of Jews from their, you know, just their everyday lives, so working and doing business and engaging with their families and being part of a community, transitioning them into being demoneyed, depropertied, and, and sent either out of the country or eventually as it, the slow churn led into the the final unraveling of the of the final solution it was into into camps and forced work and and into death but he was responsible for and was apparently very good at organizing these uh, kind of mass movements and figuring out how to to get them to voluntarily engage in the process and getting like Jewish groups and uh, prominent Jewish groups and the like to agree to help with this and like what kind of stipends do you give them so that they're more attractive to foreign countries when you're trying to get rid of them and as far as I, I remember from the book he initially it was just Eichmann was just trying to move them around and get their property confiscated and get them shuttled off to other countries and make them attractive to other countries so that he could get rid of them and then eventually it changed it shifted uh, when they they just had a meeting if you can imagine somebody having a meeting about this sort of thing. They just sit down and say, okay, well, this is now the solution. This is now what we're going to be doing here. And then at that point, he has to figure out how to push them one way or another. And as he says during the trial, he didn't kill anybody. He never killed anybody. He never ordered anybody to kill anybody. But he eventually knew this is exactly what was happening. And he was the one who was organizing this uh, this large, you know, massive process of how do we how do we get this, get this to work. And there were very fascinating details about exactly the the kind of things that he was doing and the th kinds of things that he came up with, which I can't recount right now. I know I, because uh, I listened to the audiobook and I took some notes as I was going through it. Yeah, I listened to the audiobook twice all the way through, but it's really difficult. You know, if I'm not reading and I can like take notes and highlight stuff, but I just, I don't have time. Uh, you know, I have to do it on the commute or while I'm doing something else. I, that's when I can get through these books because there are just too many of them. But anyway, so uh, I, obviously I'm going to, by the end, spoiler alert, I'm going to recommend the freaking thing. But anyway. Oh, I was talking about, where am I going? I was talking about the freaking, the subtitle of the banality of evil, and I was getting too deep into it. So this is such a fascinating idea because it's so, it's more terrifying than, <laughs> than Satan with his horns and his tail and his pitchfork. It's like, I can tell, I can tell that you're evil and you're going to do evil things. When somebody that says dopey and someone who seems so unremarkable and vaguely stupid as Adolf Eichmann, but those kind of people can be capable of sitting in a chair and, and causing the mass death of a group of people that's that's what's shocking and and scary and a lot of people were revolted by this idea that evil can be so mundane uh, you know they figure that it has to be some kind of a mastermind it has to be what's his name bloomfeld <laughs> why am i not up on my james bond isms what happened in my life that I haven't paid attention to? I didn't see many of the James Bonds. I saw the new ones with Daniel Craig, but anyway, it's just it's not the the guy with 
the cat making an evil plan and all that that sort of thing and it's not a big scar on their face that marks them for <laughs> for evil nature but it's just the banality of of the people who could be involved in this and i really think that's a, a very important idea to get down because it's not just it's not just that because you know people want to point to kind of other it's like okay this one wasn't a monster but you know other evil people are monsters and easy to identify right but in reality the whole the concept of of evil in general the concept of being able to carry out something that's evil who knows what evil is of course but being able to carry out something that's so completely against anything that we would consider viable in polite society or even conceivable when it comes to the human animal and the kinds of things that we would be willing or able to do like the idea of being able to do evil is it's not special. It's not its own unique category. It's just a, it's a thing of, uh, it's like if you're trying to deal with a, a manufacturing problem or something like that. It's, it's something that you just need to, you need to correct for and, and try to get rid of. Now, the, the meaning of the, the subtitle here is just that Arendt was just struck by the fact that Eichmann seemed so dopey and stupid and, you know, he wasn't just over abounding with all this vitriol against the Jews and he just, uh, was kind of a, a cog in a wheel and didn't really think about it and didn't really care and there's no more nuanced understanding of <laughs> okay you've got me uh i wanted to nothing like that you know it, it's just it's just a guy in a weird situation who wasn't uh, particularly nice or upstanding or anything like that he just did what he did and that was it so how do you notice it how do you find it in in different things but i think it goes even deeper than that that the idea of evil is not so special as we tend to make it out to be that it really is kind of a manufacturing problem as opposed to some kind of giant moral problem. It's just a, a matter of combining things as a human primate, combining things like evolved inclinations uh, that are, uh, you know, have been evolved for uh, millions of years of, of evolution in a particular situation that have been useful for propagating genes. It wasn't like somebody was sitting in the background saying that these are the characteristics that people should evolve. So like these ones work, and so we're going to have those. And now because we were so successful as a species, now those things are being amplified 15 million fold because we have so much influence and we can do those sorts of things and it's just you know these were for our little tribes of like 40 to 150 individuals that's what these evolved inclinations were for so if you have an in-group out-group idea that's evolved and now you've got the means to be able to handle 6 million people then it's just being it's being shoved the other way it's being it's being the same thing is being used in a different way and we're not smart enough to be able to understand that this is a, such a different scale from what we would otherwise be encountering based on our, our biological inclinations from being evolved primates. So it's not that special. It, it's just, it's a flaw. It's a manufacturing flaw. It's one of those things that that it's going to show up because you have large numbers. It's going to show up and, and you're going to have these defects uh, that we just, we want to call defects because they don't work on the scale that we're, <laughs> we're talking about or in the right ways that we want them to work nowadays. And you just have to, because you have such large numbers and 7 billion billion people you have to work out how to how to deal with those defects and how to either excise them or identify them early enough that you can do something about i mean god it's such a oh we happy few okay so that's about the stuff but this one you know Arendt talks about the judges and the, it's israeli judges and they, they were questioned on their impartiality ability to be impartial in this kind of a situation which is understandable uh, apparently the prime minister at the time ben Gurion of israel had a very distinct <laughs> specific interest in this particular trial so the wonder is, is this a show trial or is this a real trial? Is it really trying to figure out whether this person should be condemned, you know, and sent to prison or killed? Or is it just to get revenge on a national scale uh, so that it's, it's kind of reasserting themselves on the national theater? And that's the question. And Arendt is very skeptical that the judges could be impartial in this kind of a situation. Also, there were a number of a number of issues, international law issues uh, that were related to it. You know, it kind of talks, it talks about the ins and outs of the creep of this unspeakable evil that we want to label unspeakable evil and it's uh, i mean this is what i find most terrifying about it is that it's such a slow creep there's just this this idea that i have related to this book of the moment when eichmann he's doing this thing of relocating and trying to figure out the best way to get jewish organizations involved and trying to get get rid of jews in the country and dealing with other countries and how we're gonna how we're gonna organize this and all that all that sort of stuff making making the emigrating jews 
Jews more palatable by giving them stipends. You know, they confiscated their freaking property and their money and all that, but they give them some kind of a stipend to make them more palatable to foreign countries. But it's just that it's a slow transition from that, just moving people that you don't like and don't want in your country, to, okay, now we're putting them in camps and killing them, including, uh, not to be sexist, but including women and children. Uh, sorry, men. I'm <laughs> sorry, you're always disposable. <laughs> but uh, including women and children, just having them die by, uh, you know, starvation or exposure or or outright murdering them because they're not desirable to the higher ups. You know, the bureaucracy doesn't really like them. So we're going to get rid of them that way. It's that that part of it is what's uh, the scariest to me is that that slow transition, that slow creep. And you wonder if, you know, once they're in the midst of this world war and they're not the brightest individuals, <laughs> that's for sure. So you wonder if they're in the midst of this and they have certain avenues of power that they can exert. So why not just do whatever you can? Why not just take it to the next level? Because we're not just running through. We ran through France, sure, but... <laughs> We're not running through the rest of the Allied powers, and we're not running through Russia or the Soviet Union. We're not doing that, so it's not as easy as we thought it would be, and and now we just need to exert power in some other way. But whatever the case, whatever the, the reasoning was or the rationale that they proffered anyway, it's still, it's, it's, it's scary to think of that, that slow transition, that slow creep. And one of the one of the really fascinating aspects of this was uh, looking at the way that other countries responded. So it it was difficult because obviously you're in the middle of a war. You have to maintain authority in Germany. You have to maintain control over satellites that you've taken, and you have to still be able to exert force in countries that you haven't invaded or anything like that, but who are close to you and who you are trying to effectuate this final solution through. Some countries like Denmark just weren't having it. They're just not doing it. No matter what the Germans, the Germans, uh, want to say about it. They're, they're just simply not doing it. Other countries, Belgium, Holland, and Sweden, they did it in different ways. You know, some of them were accommodating. Some of them were full-fledged just participating. Places like Italy, I know they they had a contentious relationship when it came to this. Uh, the Italians had no interest, uh, as far as I remember from the book, the Italians had no interest in trying to... They didn't have a Jewish problem. <laughs> they didn't see a Jewish problem, and they didn't want to participate in this. Um, but there was still, there was a the complex relationship between Italy. Italy and Germany and Hitler and Mussolini and you had to figure out okay how are we going to appease and what were we going to do with them and and all that sort of thing so though that part was fascinating and I mean I'm definitely going to read this again after doing this after recording this and going through that so like I said I just I enjoyed the writing I enjoyed the intricacies of it you know it was it was freaking depressing in some <laughs> some aspects because you definitely want just as a human being you definitely want there to be some clear indicator that that there's real evil here and it's it, you can identify it so the next time you see somebody who's who's really evil you could be ah, no that guy that guy <laughs> and point to some authorities who could just pick him up and be like hey we're were you going to kill a whole bunch of people? And he's like, ah, God, you caught me. And then you just get rid of him, you know, uh, you, you want to be able to do that. Often wasn't the case, you know, it's just, it, these are too complex of systems for human primates to be able to really grasp what's going on. And it's too complex in a given situation. If, if like your superior comes to you, if you're in a, in a bureaucracy and your superior comes to you and says, okay, yeah, um, so everybody in this area, we're going to start killing them. So just, uh, just go ahead and start doing that. Um, we could talk about it later. Then uh, to some degree, you know, it's so much situation going on. It's just too much. It's overloading your, your feeble little brain. And of course, all of us, you know, everybody in the West now and, um, and most everybody anywhere, I'm assuming, but the West particularly feels guilty for, for this sort of thing. But we would claim, or at least we want to believe that in the same situation that we would not accede, we would be the resistance. We'd be Luke and Leia, uh, not, <laughs> Fader and, and whoever from the new ones. We'd resist and say that, no, we're not going to participate in that, and, and we're going to overthrow, and, and like Tom Cruise is going to assassinate, or at least attempt to, uh, the big cheese and get it over with that way. But, you know, who knows? Who knows with the proper motivations and incentive structure? Who knows uh, where where any of us would go. So during the during the trial, oh, one of the setups for the trial is that he was kidnapped, actually, in, in contravention of international law. And there were some very specific reasons that this was questionable. Uh, there were like, like he had to violate a law in the, the state in which he was acting to be condemnable under international law, under the rules through international law. And in Germany, he didn't violate any laws. He was following the law. He was doing exactly what Der Fuhrer uh, said and what he said 
said was considered the law. So he couldn't be kidnapped. I think he was in Venezuela or something like that at the time when he was found. But he couldn't be kidnapped and tried in another country because he hadn't he hadn't broken any crimes in that country in Israel. He hadn't broken any crimes. Oh, he hadn't committed any crimes. Broken any crimes. <laughs> he hadn't committed any crimes as far as Israel was, was concerned. So this is one of the things that, that didn't make a whole lot of sense and which suggested it was is more show than substantive execution of justice. Uh, so as Eichmann, you know, was wont to point out, he didn't kill anybody. He was just following the law, you know, Nuremberg Berg defense. And I, as I said, Arendt was struck by the fact that Eichmann was just not very intelligent. And as I was listening to the things that he had to say about in his own defense, I was like, no, idiot. Why would you say something like that? I was like, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm fine with it. But if I'm his defense attorney, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that any defense attorney in that particular situation is they're going to do their best and there should be a higher ethical standard that they have to give the best defense humanly possible. But I'm sure that they they weren't doing that. Uh, you know, if they could be ostracized for the rest of their lives, uh, despite their reputations for doing too good a job, especially if he got off in this particular situation. So, but he's not very intelligent. He said a whole bunch of stupid stuff, possibly, you know, for the better, who knows, but and who knows if anything could have changed, changed the fate. I didn't go deep into the, the particular legal standards that were applied in this particular case. Uh, he likened himself to Pontius Pilate in the decision of the final solution. <laughs> so, so that's standard go-to is like Pontius Pilate washing his hands of the death of Jesus, which of course is not historically the case anybody who's read uh, New Testament criticism all this nonsense didn't happen but so Pontius Pilate in the story washes his hands in front of the, the Jewish people and says uh, I am clean of this man's death I don't believe he committed any crime etc and you see this a lot actually in, in this uh, this era when they're talking about Jesus and Paul etc it's like the authorities like who did Paul say he was he was good buddies with or there was like a later letter that said that Paul hung out with, with like Pontius Pilate or somebody, I don't know, some Caesar or something like that, and they, they were good buddies. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> or he wrote like a letter on his behalf, a, a recommendation letter or something like that. I don't remember what it was. But anyway, so, but he, Eichmann likens himself to Pontius Pilate and says, that, yes, I washed my hands of the final solution. That wasn't, I didn't have a, a part in that. Uh, I was just trying to organize a very complex geographical issue and, uh, you know, sociological issue. I was just trying to deal with that. And uh, the Israeli, the, the judges sent in, or I don't know if it was on by the judges, but somebody sent in six psychologists to determine if Eichmann was sane and all six determined that he was as far as I remember or I think they were going through remember there's some discussion of it there, there might have been some dissent actually in that there was none I mean all of them thought that he was sane enough to determine you know right from whatever our standard is it's like he understood the difference between right and wrong it, it was just a matter of would it be enough to get him off of this responsibility for this particular crime and I can't remember the details of that uh, in particular but anyway so uh, the criticism that the kind of the backlash related to and there's a lot more in the book obviously I don't want to go through the whole thing but criticism was that a lot of people said it was too sympathetic to the accused and I don't know like obviously anything that's that's uh, criticizing the facts or the structure or something like that then it's I mean that's fine but too sympathetic I don't know. I didn't get that it was sympathetic in, at all. I got like kind of outraged that it was that this person was sufficient to be able to do this kind of evil. It was like, what the hell are we doing as a species if somebody this pathetic, that this uh, person who's not remarkable and not particularly capable or anything like that is able to get enough power to do this kind of damage? Like, what it, what the hell are we doing if this is possible? That's that's what I got from it. I didn't get sympathy. I got a, a like really really considering this as a, a failure of the species. And I think this, this is like a quote, I think. Uh, banality, in this sense, is not that Eichmann's actions were ordinary, that there is a potential Eichmann in all of us, but that his actions were motivated by a sort of stupidity, which was wholly unexceptional. And that's uh, that's kind of an important distinction, because the way I was talking about it earlier, it's, uh, and I think this was, which this is later, Arendt uh, explaining it. I need to <laughs> index these things a little better. It's hard when it's, uh, when I'm just listening to the freaking thing, but, and I'll do it when I have more time, you know, if I can get some more traction so I can justify taking more time then I can I can do this uh, more efficiently and effectively and make sure all of it's you know well sourced and all that sort of stuff but anyway so the quote was talking about how because I kind of intimated that it was a potential Eichmann and all of this kind of idea but it's not really about that it's really about that he is so dopey and doesn't really isn't very capable and still was able to do the 
this sort of thing. You know, he wasn't the the criminal mastermind, the the evil genius that we portray in movies that makes us feel better. It's like it's only the exceptional that can do this kind of thing. Uh, he's just he's not very bright and not very capable, and still could just do this. And uh, I know one commentator she criticized Arendt in saying that Arendt's treatment of this particular issue was biased and it was supporting her views on totalitarianism. And I didn't go too deeply into this. This is already getting into almost 30 minutes. Uh, but she had some other writings Arendt did on totalitarianism. And she had some particular ideas there. And uh, this particular critic was saying that Arendt was specifically had in mind that she was trying to support this idea that she had about totalitarianism. And that's why she espoused these certain ideas about Eichmann and, and assess the trial in the way she did, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't, I mean, to me, when I was going through the book, and I haven't perfectly vetted this or anything, but when I was going through the book, it did not sound to me like Arendt was being biased. It sounded like she was genuinely shocked that somebody so stupid and incapable <laughs> could could accomplish the things that he was able to accomplish. And whatever version of the book I read, uh, I can't remember the name of the woman who who was doing the reading for uh, for the audiobook, but she was she was great. She was fantastic. So I thoroughly loved that part of it. So what are my thoughts on it? It's it's really well written. I loved getting the historical context. You know, that's something that I it took some classes on in undergrad, but when I went to uh, you know, I went to law school in lieu of graduate school or getting a PhD or anything. So so I didn't get to study in depth all of this stuff. So it was great getting some historical context of what was going on and how other countries were responding. And I'd love to know more about it. I took a, a whole class on, on Nazi Germany, uh, and I don't remember a whole bunch from it. <laughs> but uh, I remember my final my final paper was on, on propaganda and the way that propaganda was structured and how it... And I was trying to... I remember what, what I was going off of was within, like internally in the rhetoric, it was, it was dehumanizing. Not in that it was saying that uh, Jews were not humans, but... It, it was like without recognizing it or acknowledging it it was it left out <laughs> that Jews were humans which were which was much more effective because it, it worked on a on a subconscious level too so but it was it was all complicated I don't know if anybody actually got what I was trying to say they just said yeah they were dehumanizing Jews whatever but it, it was deeper than that but anyway it was in the way that they used the words the way they structured the stuff but anyway and I like, uh, I love the way, like, it goes in and out of the trial, and it gives background and, and comes back to it. I liked how that was structured, and obviously, it's, a, and this could be part of the, because it, it was, it was a different, it was a different angle to take on this. You know, it's easy to just say that, oh, look at this horrible person, let me just report on this horrible person. But it was a different angle to take it from the other side and say that, is this trial really legitimate? You know, uh, are people being, and she totally respected the judges and all that sort of stuff, but it was, um, is this fair? Is this legitimate? Is this really justice being served, or is it a is it a farce? Is it a theater? And you know the banality of evil idea is is certainly the most resounding from the work. You know whether we perfectly espouse it or break it down in the right way, it's still, it's the most important idea. And it made me think about like we we talk about from this direction, you know, ever since um, the banality of evil, but the banality of love, I think, is an equally <laughs> Equally important and, and applicable idea uh, when it comes to this this sort of thing, and I think it's it's greater than just he was stupid and able to do all these things. Uh, that there's there's more to it than that. That that it really is. It's it, it's a defect. It's a it's a product coming off the line. You know, with the where the the parts don't don't exactly match, and and then we just have to deal with that as they're going along. It just happens to be in you know in a very complex primate as opposed to you know, a little action figure or something like that. And it's something that, you know, a bunch of other people can have defects, but they don't just don't happen in the same way. They just don't cause the same things. So it's a it's a manufacturing problem as opposed to <laughs> suppose it's some kind of grand moral problem for the ages or something like that. So, I'm, I mean, obviously highly recommend it. Certainly suggests maybe of all the all the books I've read from the Sam Harris reading list so far, maybe this one the most I think this one the most. Oh, I like the DMT one a lot, but probably this one the most. So yeah, high high recommendation. But anyway, whatever the case, it was it was thoroughly thoroughly enjoyable, and um, that's gonna be it for this one. And any questions, comments, whatever the case, uh, but you can email me lastcoffeehouse at gmail dot com. You can go to the Facebook Last Coffee House. What else? Anything else? I don't know. I don't know. Just do things. You know, stay aggressive. Be aggressive. You know that kind of thing. Okay, thanks. <laughs>